Okay, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to, to one of the stories of Jesus out of Acts, uh, sorry, out of Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 5. I'll let you get to there in a moment. And um, I just want to bring a couple of, couple of short stories um, just to tie today up. Chapter 11, verse, starting from verse 5. And he, he said to them, which of you has a friend who will go to him, who'll go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. For my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he'll not get up and give him anything, because he is a friend, yet because of his input impudence, He'll rise up. Is that the right word? Impudence? Im impudence? <laughs> Impudence. Impudent, isn't that? No. <laughs> he will rise up and get. No, I'm sure it's not impudence. <laughs> He'll rise up and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Or if anyone asks, he receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. Now, this, this passage, this kind of funny story, was told by Jesus just after they told him, they asked him, teach us to pray in Luke 11, chapter uh, verse 1. And the lesson he's teaching through this parable is to be persistent in prayer. And there's two parables, actually, that Jesus told us to drive home this concept. And whenever, whenever you find in Scripture there's kind of different, different stories that say the same thing, I believe the Lord's trying to re-emphasize or emphasize a particular point. And he's trying to drive this concept home. In Luke chapter 18, a few verses, a chapters later, he told them a parable to show that they must always pray and not be discouraged, saying there was a certain judge in a certain town who did not fear God and did not respect people. And there was a widow in that town, and she kept coming to him saying, grant me justice against my adversary. And he was not willing for a time. But after these things, he said to himself, even if I do not fear God or respect people, yet because this widow is causing trouble for me, she's driving me crazy, I'll grant her justice. I put the I'm driving me crazy, and that's not in the Bible. <laughs> So she does not wear me out at the end by her coming back. And the Lord says, listen to what the unrighteous judge is saying. And will not God surely see to it that justice is done to his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? And, he'll and he will delay it. And will he delay towards them? I tell you that he will see to it that justice is done for them soon. Then he finishes this with, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And this is a kind of crazy story, you know. And sometimes Jesus, Jesus told some strange stories that almost seem kind of contradictory. But to his hearers, put yourself in their shoes. The story of the man who had no bread for his guests was a very familiar one. They lived in a culture that it was all about socialization. It was all about being being in that right place, doing the right thing by your neighbour. So they understood that story. Or well, the unrighteous judge was very familiar territory to them in their culture because they understood the Romans treated them with disrespect and they knew if they went to court, they would not be, be listened to. So they understood that this story was speaking to where they were at, saying similar things. But Jesus was using these familiar stories to emphasise an important point about persistence, even in the face of seeming rejection or refusal. And he poses a question at the, at the end of this, this, this parable. It's kind of like, what is he saying? When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Really what he's saying, you know, when I return... Things will be so different, perhaps so challenging, that I wonder whether 
I'll even find those of faith waiting for my return when I come back. It sort of seems incredulous, doesn't it? But the inference is that times will become so changed that people will no longer believe, no longer trust in God. And, you know, we're living in a time like that, aren't we? People that used to be part of the things of faith. The other week I was sharing with you some statistics that come and, you know, there's statistics and there's statistics, but there are so many people that used to be a part of the kingdom, part of the church. They're no longer are walking in that way. And we're living in a day where people have given up on the things of God. And I believe it's it's part of a last day thing. Sadly, today, it seems that there are so many who are willing to spend, they're not really willing to spend a time to have a relationship with the Lord. I know what it says in the word that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, you know, faith is like the language, if you like, of heaven. In Hebrews chapter 11, we know that famous passage of scripture. It says faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And, and Paul stresses in, in 1 Thessalonians that we need to pray always without giving up. Faithful, never ceasing, persistent prayer. It's the permanent calling of every true disciple. You know, prayer is the thing that God's called us to have. It's a thing that God's called us to carry. Like the persistent widow, we're needy, dependent children who trust in a merciful God who, to alone supply what we need. Not on our own resources, not into our own strength, our own abilities, our own triumph. But friends, there's something about dependence on God, a willingness to submit to, to him is part of our relationship that's such an imperative. And I think Jesus is saying these stories, trying to say to people, hey, I, I want you to recognize that you need to constantly keep on knocking. This relationship with the Father through me is a relationship that is based on your prayer life. You know, whilst faith is the language of the kingdom, the currency of the kingdom is prayer. You know, and it's so easy to become a ritual, kind of a, a rote thing. I remember some time ago I was invited to go to a prayer meeting in one of the churches around here, and because of my role in the minister's network, and they said, I'll come along to this prayer prayer thing, you know, and, and I was sitting there and they had handed out bits of paper and, and they were following this thing and, and they were saying it's a prayer meeting and they didn't pray the whole thing, you know. They would say at the end of sentences, let us pray. Let us pray, oh God, and then they'd continue, you know. And I'm thinking, hang on, that's not prayer, you know. And it's so easy to replace prayer with something else, you know, to replace prayer with, oh, just a, a word of thanks. But, friends, God is looking for those who continually knock, who continually come before him. You know, it's interesting. I've started watching the Wailing Wall in, 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 in Israel, in Jerusalem, I found a a, a 24 7 channel that just you can just it just films it constantly I don't know about you but it really interests me you know and I, I kind of watch it I don't know why I watch it but I do but but it's really interesting watching the, the the Jews they come up and they've got their big furry hats you know and they'll come up and they'll start to bob back and forward or they'll rock from side to side you know and it's really interesting every day you've seen the side oh, that's that same guy he's back again today and he's there bobbing back and forth you know and the thing is, though, it's just a ritual. It's a, it's a thing they do. You know, maybe they think about God in the midst of it, but it's a ritual that makes them feel kind of good. But I want to say that, that faith or prayer without faith is not prayer. It's just something else. And the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. And prayer is the substance of faith, believing prayer. You know, it seems that most of us have got things you've been praying for most of your Christian life. Who, who's got something you've been praying for and you still haven't seen it happen? And you think, well, what's with that God? But the thing is you keep praying, you keep believing. But, friends, it's somehow in the waiting, 
It's in the trusting that changes us. It's actually the action of prayer that shapes us. It shapes who we are. It's the humbling of ourselves that God's looking for. It's the reliance on his mercy, on his kindness that produces trust within us as sons and daughters. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. This is kind of a mystery, you know, but there's something so powerful in the humbling of ourselves before the throne saying, God, I need you. And you think, well, why isn't God answering? Well, he is, but the answer is not quite as we expected. It's the changing of us. You know, at prayer life is a place of processing. It's a processing a relationship with him. You know, it's such a privilege to be able to spend time in his presence. It really is. It's a privilege. He actually gives us this opportunity to spend time. I was sharing the other week, you know, I come here on Wednesday night and and Mark and the team, they, they run this, this youth outreach. It's going really well and good things are happening with this. But I go in the other room and pray. And I feel like I get this really cool role, you know, because I get in there and I've, I have to be here for a couple of hours because I'm committed to it, you know. But, but for me, I'm able to get into that place of just being able to intercede, stand before the throne. And I feel what a privilege that is to be able to stand in his presence. And friends, so few of us take that time. But I want to say to you today, the Lord is calling for people that recognize that place of prayer, that place of intercession, that place of fellowship is a place where he shapes you. It's a place where he changes you. You know, it's the petitioning him, the aggressive prayer. Sometimes I'll be praying and I just have this sense, this warrior sense comes on me and I start to speak that which is not as though it is and powerfully declare those things. Who, who understands that? And the Bible says heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. This is a, an aggressive, oh, God, I'm standing in that place. And it's this tenacity in prayer that I'm going to have this, not accepting any other outcome. It's believing prayer. It's faith-filled prayer. Whatever you ask for prayer, the Bible, well, for in prayer, the Bible says, believe that you've already received it and it shall be yours. That's a promise from the word of God. And God's looking for those who start to say, you know, God, I believe the word. I believe what you've said. This is mine. I'm going to have this in Jesus' name. You know, every night before I go to bed, I pray for my family, you know, pray for my kids and pray for my family, pray for Sue's mom and, you know, just that's part of what I do. And it's like, oh, it's just a, a thing. But I believe it's the faithfulness of God that he, he listens to those prayers. And the Bible said he carries them in bowls up to heaven. Wow, your prayers are incense before him. You know, Jesus is instructing his disciples in these passages that our prayer should be so filled with faith that there's no other option. And friends, this is the sort of faith that really attracts God. You know, I was sharing this story the other week when we were talking about revival, but Smith Wigglesworth was, a, was, a, was an incredible example of this. When he, when he came to Australia, he was he's an amazing man, you know. He was walking down the streets, I think it was in Sydney, and he saw a man entirely crippled, struggling to even take a few steps. With the aid of crutches, he went up to him and he said to him, would you like to be whole? The man replied with some astonishment that it was impossible. Unperturbed, Wigglesworth said to him, if you believe, meet me at such and such a room at that hotel over there at this time. Now, I'm imagining that the man was pretty intrigued, thinking, well, this is crazy. How could I ever be here? I'm a cripple. 
but with a deep sense of scepticism and possibly a rising voice of hope, he entered the hotel at the agreed time with some difficulty with the aid of sticks, walked in, and sometime later, he walked out completely whole without any support, with no sticks. Wigglesworth walked in such authority, but he took the promise of God that heaven suffers violence and the violent will take it by force. He understood the promise of Scripture. You know, after Smith Wigglesworth died in 1947, doctors found that some of the bone on each of his kneecaps was missing. And later in his house, they found two little indentations about a foot apart in, on the wooden floor in the corner of one of his rooms. And they surmised that he spent so much time in that place crying out before God. We saw the public ministry of this man, but the private ministry was crying out before the throne. And friends, God is looking for those who will pay that kind of price in this hour. The secret to his extraordinary power was the place, the place of humbling himself, humbling himself before God. The power came from his devotion. You know, I read a quote recently and it says, prayer does, does not change God, but it changes him who prays. And E.W. Bounds or E.M. Bounds said, prayer makes a godly man and puts within him the mind of Christ, the mind of humility, of self-surrender, of service, of pity, and of prayer. If we really pray, we'll become more like God or else we'll quit, quit praying. You know, friends, why does Jesus call us to pray? Because he knows it's the place where we'll do our dealing. It's the place where we'll do a changing. You know, I love it when we go through things and we, we learn principles in, in our walk with the Lord, but it's actually on our knees that we learn to be the man or the woman that God's called us to be. And to, today, perhaps you're in a difficult place. You know, maybe you're in a, in a battle, you're in a struggle. Can I encourage you? This is the time for you to be coming before the throne with those things, keep petitioning him, keep knocking. The Bible says knock and keep on knocking. Even that unrighteous judge says, I'll give him what he's required of me. And friends, God's saying to us in this time, if you will just keep petitioning me, keep on applying it, and yes, I'll answer it, but in the, in the process, I'm developing you. In the process, I'm changing you. In the process, I'm making you the man or the woman that God's called you to be. Who believes that this morning? Amen. I want you to bow your heads right across the room today. Father, we thank you for, for the privilege of being able to come before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord God, that you use prayer, Lord, to change us, to develop us to challenge us, to put your finger on things in our hearts. Lord, this morning we recommit to that place, Lord, of, of allowing prayer to be our go-to place. Father, help us. Help us to surrender in, in, that, in that precious, precious place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.